Despite myself being one of End of Evangelion and, in extension, Neon Genesis Evangelion's louder voices of praise here on YouTube, I never took that much time to check out creator and director Hideaki Anno's other work. It's about time I did, and the first film that made it onto my list was 1998's Love and Pop, an adaptation of Ryu Murakami's second Topaz novel. You know, the guy who also wrote Coin Locker Babies and inspired Silent Hill 4. So it's no surprise I came up profoundly moved by Hideaki Anno's Love and Pop, and if you want to know if I'd recommend it, a thousand percent yes, I would. If you're a fan of End of Evangelion and Evangelion, this is the next best thing. If you haven't seen it, I beg of you to take the next two hours or so out of your day and go check it out. It's currently been uploaded here onto YouTube, subbed in English, and honestly, this video can wait until you finish that movie. Love and Pop, despite being a departure from the Ava franchise, has several echoes contained within that allude to Anno's involvement. This is just a guess on my part, but I have the feeling that the motivation to film Love and Pop was conceived almost entirely from Anno's work in the live-action medium through the cut real world sequence from EOE. Stripped from the home release of the movie, the sequence shows the mundane lives of Asuka and Misato as they deal with their lives and relationships and such. I think Anno is fascinated with the condition of young people in particular, and I, I don't think I've seen any other Eastern director capture that quite as well as Hideaki Anno. Love and Pop follows Hiromi Yoshi, a 16-year-old girl disenchanted with life at the start of the film, dreaming about people walking into death, meditating over personal failures by comparing herself to her friends and their accomplishments, and feeling like childhood and life is slipping through her fingers. She's obsessed with her nails and taking pictures to preserve memories. She feels like she can be fulfilled if she earns enough money to buy an approximately around $2,000 ring. To get enough money, she participates in Enjokusai, something she learned from her friends. Enjokusai, or compensated dating, is a Japanese phenomena where older men pay younger women to go out with them for various reasons, sometimes sexual, other times not. Hiromi sells her services to these men in order to get enough money for the ring. The film was shot on prosumer Sony handycams, the kind of thing that you can pick up for around a thousand or two US dollars. Love and Pop feels distinctly gorilla because of this, even going so far as to have dirt on the lenses. This lends itself pretty well to the movie, making you feel at times like you're watching this on-the-spot documentary, and that makes you feel more in tune with a very real aspects of the subject matter. A bit contrary to the realism, however, is the cinematography, and there are some crazy shots used in this film. You can almost see the way Hideaki Anno and his crew obtained them too, like sticking a camera on a pole and putting it inside a plastic box and then pouring liquid onto it. The film has been praised and criticized for its experimental nature, positioning the camera in various unconventional places. I would normally hate the results of this kind of renegade filmmaking, but here I actually love it. It's simple enough to interpret, but not so much so that you, you feel like it's obvious. It reminds you that you're watching a written movie with themes and symbols and metaphors despite it, its documentary tone, and surprisingly, those two aspects mesh well together. When you see a tracking shot where the camera turns a corner, you can relate it to the one that you saw previously where Ono attached a camera to a toy train, and then think about how that scene in particular relates to the motif of trains. Train cars are used throughout the film, and while they symbolized running away in Ava, here they symbolize the linearity of life, yet despite this, the train and the camera make turns. Despite life being linear, there are turns for the worse and for the better, and I think that's what he was trying to communicate here with the cinematography. It happens at very crucial moments. The editing and shooting decisions for this film are a direct evolution of the kinds of things we were seeing in End of Eva. Fisheye lenses to communicate discomfort, superimposition as a reference to stream of consciousness, aspect ratios warping to create claustrophobia, on-screen text in place of dialogue to create a sense of distance between characters, poetic editing in tune with music for melancholy, even classical stock music is used. All those aspects are here, but Love and Pop adds its own stylistic decisions on top of the ones made for Evangelion. Much of Love and Pop is shot in first person, embodying and identifying with certain characters, primarily that of Hiromi, our protagonist, but also unexpectedly with Captain EO, the troubled man who talks to a stuffed animal based on Michael Jackson's fuzzball. Yeah, that shit from the 80s that no one remembers. What? Oh, what? What? Scream like a George Lu Wait. And press for cool. What? When a point of view shot, or POV shot as it's called, is used, it, it usually means that we are meant to identify with the character who we are embodying. So when it's used on Captain EO, I think that's Ano's way of trying to get us to understand what he's doing and not see him directly as a villain. He's someone who's willing to scare Hiromi into giving up on her material nature in Enjokusai. He's someone who's acting hateful out of love rather than out of hate, if that makes sense. 
POV shots are much easier done with the live action medium rather than animation, though it has been attempted on occasion. The camera is so intimate with the characters throughout this movie invading their personal space, it's difficult not to feel uncomfortable when the characters are feeling uncomfortable, or scared when they're scared. I can see why some people would dislike the directing, but I think it's brilliant and each shot has a ton of care and thought put into it, regardless of if it's done for fun or not. Much of Love and Pop is told through the hypocritical perspective of its characters. This reminds me heavily of Fully Cooley, another work related to Anno but made years later. Hiromi is so desperate to enter adulthood despite saying otherwise, as evidenced by her career-driven anxieties and participation in Nenjoka's eye. She's a character that can only see two feet in front of her in a matter of speaking. She complains about her friends being better off in life, taking up dance, computers, or having an adult perspective on sexuality. She thinks she has no path. But it's evident when watching the film that Hiromi's passions lie in cosmetology. She's the kind of person where if you pointed that out, they'd shrug it off and be like, nah, I can't see myself doing that, but wind up going to school for it a few years down the line. I think we've all met people like that. Yet, Anno never addresses cosmetology as a solution to her problems, sort of leaving it in plain sight without ever touching on it. She has such low self-esteem, and it's because of this lack of self-esteem that she never comes to any conclusions about what she does best. I've seen some people conclude in various text reviews online that Hiromi is driven by greed to possess the ring, but I disagree heavily with this conclusion. I think Hiromi's ring appeals to her because it's something solid, like a photograph, something that can be kept a reminder a memento. Looking at it together with her friends is part of the appeal, as well as the desire to earn it on her own. She's trying to prove herself. The ring is directly in association with self-esteem and memories, but as her internal monologue suggests, the ring will only give her a fleeting sense of accomplishment. In a way though, despite not being out of greed, this is also a form of materialism. Materialism through sentiment. Something a lot of people don't really consider when thinking about materialism. Hoarders do this all the time, clinging on to material possessions because of the sentimental value. A mug that has been purchased by a lost loved one, for example, can be just as dangerous as any gem purchased for superficial reasons. Hell, even more so, I'd argue. These are both what the photos mean for Hiromi as well as the ring, both possessions she gives up on by the end, along with presumably Enjokusai. They're all interrelated. I think a good piece of evidence for the film's stance on materialism lies within Captain EO, who, despite preaching to Hiromi about the superficiality of getting a ring clings onto Mr. Fuzzball, a memory shared with him and his father at Disney World. Perhaps it's this twist in nature with his stuffed animal that drives him to empathize with Hiromi's situation and help her in a disfigured way. I feel as though Anna writes hypocritical characters very poignantly, and Captain EO is a great example of this. Do I think he was really planning to assault her? Maybe. He might have changed his mind, but I think it's debatable. At the end of the day, what he says gets her thinking about the importance of family and escape the people who are so void of happiness and health in their life that they can't view people as more than just props. She's not just some ring to be worn for status. As mentioned prior, trains are an important motif in this film, but there's more than just life being linear that it could represent. The film relates this motif to her father and family. As she gets home, her father shares his accomplishment with her, and then preps to disassemble the train set that he spent the movie building. Sharing happiness in the present is great as long as it doesn't become obsessive and hold you back. I think Love and Pop is a film about feeling accomplished with yourself, being blind to the things you do well right in front of your eyes and the things that you currently have. I think this movie is also about how people will eventually grow apart, but how that's a natural part of life. Everyone has their own ambitions and dreams to follow. At the end of the film, we get a dream far removed from that of the man touching a scorpion and presumably dying. In the dream, a dog is allowed the chance at life once more, and looks forward to the future. She and her friends march together during the credits in equal strides, low angle, looking forward to what the future will bring without the answers of how it will turn out. I really loved Love and Pop. I'm not sure if I'd even say it's flawed in any particular way, but I'm sure some of you will feel put off by maybe the cinematography or maybe the slower pace of the plot at the beginning. For me, however, this was a great follow-up to End of Ava. Certainly better than the Rebuild films, and 
actually resonates and strengthens many of the messages in the original Neon Genesis, perhaps even told better than in the original series. If you watched the video without heeding my warning, I definitely recommend you go back and check out this movie. And for those of you who have seen the film to watch this video, I hope that I helped out a little bit in terms of interpretation. For those of you who have been following my channel for a while, I've been promising this Ray an analysis video and don't worry, it's coming. But I first have to get settled into my new apartment and finish up a Madoka video I was commissioned to do. If you're watching this video, it means that I've just gotten my internet back so I can begin doing research once again. I've also been considering starting a Patreon to support having this new apartment since it'll throw a wrench into my video making if I just get a quote unquote real job. It's about $2,000 to live a month and I'm, I'm basically borrowing money. <laughs> Let me know if, what you guys think about that or if you'd be interested in that sort of thing. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you very soon. This has been Go Jesus, and I hope you have a great day.